Luke chapter 11, Gospel of Luke chapter 11. As you're turning there, singing O Holy Night, I was thinking, well, there are many parts of the world that are still thinking about Christmas, and their date of Christmas is the 6th of January, so they're still in the midst of it. So we just was thinking about those Eastern nations that remember Christmas at a different time than we do. Luke chapter 11 is where we are this evening as we commence again in our studies in the Gospel of Luke. So, it have been some years here already, and uh, we are so slowly making our way through. And we come to chapter 11, and I trust we'll look at it with the Lord's help and much profit. The Lord Jesus is making His way to Jerusalem. He is on that journey, and Luke gives much detail of all that transpires in the kind of process of Christ beginning to make His way to Jerusalem and eventually ending up there. And so, as that what seems like a long journey as far as Luke records, uh, he gives much detail of what transpires as he sets his face as a flint, as he purposes in his mind to go and be, suffer many things of the chief priests and elders and so on. Uh, he is detailing various aspects during that time. So, Luke chapter 11, let's hear the word of the Lord from verse 1 through verse 13. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. Amen. May the Lord bless this the public reading of His precious Word. Let's pray, beloved. Let's seek the Lord for His help again this evening. Our Father, we pray for help. On these moments where we give consideration to the infallible, inerrant Word of the living God, this is a living Word. May it bring life. May it quicken the saints. May it bring to a saving knowledge of Christ those in a state of unbelief. So, guide the preacher. We ask, Lord, for help, the infilling of the Spirit. God, we beg Thee for empowerment. So, whatever self-reliance we have, deliver us of it, we ask, and grant us a full dependence upon Thee. Hear then our prayers and extend thy kingdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before us, beloved, is one of the most significant passages on one of the most challenging exercises for the genuine Christian. If you're going to fail anywhere this year in your spiritual life, 
it will most likely be in the place of prayer. In some way, if you spiritually feel, it will be in relation, most likely, to prayer. This exercise of prayer is the exercise of fellowship with God and is at the heart of our spiritual existence. It's not something we can ignore. And as familiar as we may be with the subject, we constantly wrestle with it. It is not easy to be a man or a woman of prayer. It is a constant battle, an effort, a challenge. It requires discipline, diligence, and a motivation driven by a a constant mind that is focused upon the cross and the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Baptist preacher, well known to many of us, C.H. Spurgeon, said, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this, the measure of the intensity of your prayer. Since that is the case, we should sense our constant need. We need help to pray. And the disciples understood this need, and they reflect upon it here When they ask the Lord, when they come to Him, one specifically comes and says, teach us to pray. They never asked the Lord how to preach as far as we read. They never asked how to be holy. They never asked how to raise children. They never asked how to counsel various pastoral issues. Not to say that any of that is unimportant, But we need to feel the weight of this curiosity that the disciples had that drove them to ask this, Lord, teach us to pray. We need to feel something of what they felt in this moment, perhaps something that they felt every time they saw the Lord pray, something that came to their mind, a united sense that there is something unusual in the prayer life of the Master, they saw something remarkable, something they wanted for themselves. Did they they struggle with prayer? Probably. (laughs) We have evidence of that. Certainly occasions when they failed to stay awake and pay attention and watch with Christ. So, it would appear that there's sufficient evidence to say that the disciples struggled with prayer. They had been around prayer their entire lives. They were familiar with prayer, far more so than many of us would be. And yet, like all believers, they still struggled. They struggled, though they never abandoned prayer. It is recorded of the newly converted Saul of Tarsus, when the Lord communicates to Ananias, Behold, he prayeth. And it is stated in such a way as to communicate, Ananias, there is a change that has taken place in this man's life. He now prays. I saw if Tarsus had prayed probably every day of his adult life. And he had been around prayer like any other Jew the entirety of his life. He knew prayer. But that wasn't recognized or noted in the fashion as it was after his conversion When the Lord says, Behold, he prayeth. Prayer, then, that is recognized by God is that which gives evidence to new life, that we are actually born of the Spirit, that something has taken place. There has been a transformation, a deliverance from the dead old life to a new life that communes with the living God. Our words are often confused, especially at the start, and even as we go on, they may be disjointed, they may be stumbling, but nonetheless, regardless of experience or knowledge, the Christian will pray. He will pray, and he will long to engage in it more faithfully. So, you can understand why the disciples would ask this question, why they would come to him with this request, rather, that, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. You know. You know why they would ask that. You know. You feel it in your own heart and soul. And I trust that as we look at these words, the Lord will bless them to us. We're going to look at the opening 13 verses of this chapter in four messages. That's at least how I have planned for it. 
And so this is really part one of four messages that will deal with what the overarching theme, a class on prayer with Jesus Christ. A class on prayer with Jesus Christ. And this, as I say, is just part one. And as I, I'm thinking about this, you know, if, of all the classes that we would long to have, it would be this, wouldn't it? I can't bring you into the scene. I wish I could. I can't put you right there, and I can't present before you what it was that was so in, impressive to the disciples. But something, something was notable about the prayer life of Jesus Christ that moved one disciple to ask, on behalf of them all, teach us to pray. So we're looking just at this first verse tonight, as the Lord will give us help in what we can describe simply the chief example of prayer. And we're going to note a number of things here in this chief example of prayer. First, this example shows that prayer is an absolute necessity. This example shows that prayer is an absolute necessity. Look at verse 1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, as he, if you can put the emphasis there, as he was praying in a certain place. Here we have our Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, engaging in prayer. And since He, as the sinless one, and therefore the most holy one, engaged in prayer, therefore there's a strong indication that prayerlessness, the absence of prayer, is sin. Now, you can't say that necessarily, but it certainly would appear that that is the case, especially when the language of the Lord Jesus Christ implies that men will pray. When ye pray, say and I think we can argue this also from the life of Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. You will remember that during Samuel's ministry, he had the lamentable experience of Israel requesting a king. And this grieved him no end. And of course, the Lord came to Samuel and said, look, they, it's not you they're rejecting, it's me that they've rejected to reign over them. And when all of this falls out and this is put in place. First Samuel chapter 12, we read verse 1. Can't get into everything here, but First Samuel 12 verse 1, Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye have, in all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. All right, I've given you what you wanted. You have a king now. Go down to verse 19. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil, to ask us a king. So they recognize now the, the sinfulness of their request. Reading on, Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain." For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake. Isn't that wonderful? He won't forsake His people. Because it pleased the Lord to make you His people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. So on. So Samuel senses that the absence of prayer in his life, and specifically prayer for Israel, would be sin against the Lord. Now, if prayer specifically for, for Israel is sin, then it must be concluded that the absence of prayer is sin. The neglect of prayer is sin. I don't think there's any getting around that. Of course, men may struggle with this, but this is this is it. And we have the Lord Jesus Christ here praying. He was praying. He was praying. The sinless one is praying as, of course, He would, being sinless. He will pray. There are texts even that we may see messianic influence. I think it's Psalm 109 where we see an indication that He would be a man who will pray. And here we find Him praying. Now, some may think, well, what's the point in prayer? 
Why pray? Why should Jesus Christ, of all people, pray? Is He not in control of all things? Does He not just hush the storms and silence those demons? Why would then He be given to prayer? Well, because He was, he was reflecting uh, the, the, the humanity, our humanity, in His utter dependence upon God. And so he, he must, as a man, be one given to prayer. And we also are to be given to pray. Prayer is not a denial of God's sovereignty. It's an affirmation of God's sovereignty. When we pray, we are not denying the fact that God is in control. We are affirming the fact. It is a reflection of the dependence of subordinate rational creatures to a sovereign and gracious God. We are showing our dependence. Nothing more than prayer reflects the dependence of us as rational creatures before God and subordinate to Him as prayer. We show Him that we depend upon Him, that we are not independent creatures able to exist separated from God. We need Him. And so Christ prays. Through His life, He shows this dependence. All of the time, we see Him at His baptism, pray at the commencement of His own ministry. We see Him pray when the disciples return from their first outing of ministry. We see Him pray after the death of Lazarus. We see Him pray prior to His own death on the cross. Over and over again, we see our Lord Jesus pray. And so we, as sinners, we ought to sense more need for prayer than even our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, as sinners, we find ourselves more reluctant to pray. And this is the amazing paradox of us in contrast to Christ, where we might in one sense say that if anyone could get away without prayer, it might be the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, that's not the case, but we might assume that, and yet we who are utterly and absolutely convinced of our need for help don't pray. So, as he was praying, the Lord prayed. It was an absolute necessity for him, and it must be an absolute necessity for us. And we might say that wanting to pray is a good start. The disciples clearly wanted this. I don't know to what degree they were given to prayer at this point, Certainly in the book of Acts, there is a ramping up of the details of the prayer lives of the church. But in seeing Christ pray, they are stirred themselves to want to know more about prayer. That's one of the benefits of corporate prayer. One of the benefits of corporate prayer is that, that it puts you in the presence of others that may be more experienced or others that are in a better spiritual frame than you, and they actually prompt you to long to pray. They move you in the place of prayer. You get an education when you're around the more experienced, as well as you get the prompting and encouragement of the moment of being around those that are inflamed with a heart to pray in that given occasion. Corporate prayer is a blessing that teaches us the importance of prayer. Hearing the prayers, we've all been there, we've, we've sat, we've, we've come into a meeting and bowed our heads to pray and all of a sudden someone in a higher spiritual frame, we might say, prompts us in prayer. We are moved by their calling upon God. We are pulled along by their intercession before God. We are called into the experience of prayer and true communion by them leading the way in their spiritual frame. It's wonderful, actually. It's one of the wonderful thing to come in, and maybe you don't, you're not aware of it at the time, but you, you kind of retrospectively you look back and say, I, I, was, I, was, I was dull. I was, I was not coming in tonight, really, in the frame that I ought to be, but I am leaving in a far better spiritual frame. And that brother's prayer, that sister's intercession, was the very thing God used to pull me out of the slough of despond. Encourage my heart. Lift my soul. 
One wonders then why we would avoid it. And some seem to make special effort to avoid corporate prayer. They're never, ever, ever in any place of corporate prayer. And I wonder, is it any wonder you're dull and discouraged? This is a means of grace. It's something appointed by God. It's an encouragement. And right here, I don't know what was going on in the life of the disciples at this point, but being in the presence of Christ elevated them spiritually. Just watching them pray. So this example shows that prayer is an absolute necessity. Christ prayed. Therefore, we ought. We must. We must follow in His example. But secondly, this example shows that prayer possesses a certain gravity. This example shows that prayer possesses a certain gravity. It came to pass that as He was praying in a certain place, when He ceased one of his disciples said unto him, so on. When he ceased. Two things here. The time when prayer is offered should not be interrupted. The time when prayer is offered should not be interrupted. There's something spiritually elevated about true prayer. It's quite unlike, perhaps, anything else. The disciples, or at least one, had had this desire, had this burning longing to make this request, but they refused to come near to him while prayer continued. They would not interrupt the Lord. They waited until he ceased. They waited until he was done. They couldn't bring themselves to step in there in the moment. I think, I think spiritually minded people feel that way. I have, spiritually minded people would be horrified to walk in and interrupt someone engaged in prayer. They don't want to interrupt someone who's communing with God in the frame of prayer, calling upon God. How easily, however, we are interrupted. In fact, we allow ourselves to be interrupted. We keep our devices on and they interrupt us. We allow people to interrupt us. We allow responsibilities to interrupt us. Why is this? Why? Why are we so easily given to allow an interruption in prayer? Why is it that other things seem more pressing than prayer? We just step back again. So I think we need to just we can't see the forest for the trees. We need to step out, step back, and just see what's going on. Okay, so I have an appointment to talk with God, to open up the Word, and to seek His face, and that doesn't seem important, or other things seem more important. Now, I get at times what life can be like and the pressing influences of life. I understand that. I'm not denying that. In fact, I think we see it even in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ who had to fight to withdraw from the distractions and responsibilities. But there's no fight in many believers. There is no effort in our hearts. This is the one matter of declension in our souls. Again, I think I mentioned this where someone was telling me about a question panel of all these great and lofty preachers and men that we would recognize and appreciate and value. And they're being asked questions about what is the most dangerous threat to the church today. And all these answers are being given across the panel. And they're giving things the social justice movement and all the rest of it. These, these various answers that you can imagine being given. And then one comes in and says, prayerlessness in the church. And he's right. I was told that I thought at least someone gets it. This is the biggest threat. We allow everything to interrupt prayer. And the disciples dare not interrupt Christ in prayer. They would awaken him when he was asleep and they were in trouble. They had no problem with that. And others would interrupt him as he would speak. In fact, in this very chapter you have it, if you go to verse 27 of Luke 11, it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman lifted up her voice. And again, verse 37, as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with them. So you have people who will 
interrupt, as it were, or kind of intervene in the moment of Christ teaching and preaching, but the disciples wouldn't interrupt him praying. There are lessons there. There are lessons. The time when prayer is offered should not be interrupted. The time when prayer is offered should not be interrupted. You have it here. They waited till he ceased. Learn that, Christian. Learn it. Apply it. Apply it in your own life and how you deal with others. Don't interrupt. Don't go in and interrupt when there is prayer being offered. Also, the place where prayer is offered should not be intruded. The place where prayer is offered should not be intruded. As he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, He's in a certain place. Now our Lord, in Matthew chapter 6, taught his disciples to pray in a closet. Enter into the closet. The sense is, go somewhere where you're kind of cut off from the world. Get yourself alone, where people can't hear you. In fact, in that context, he's been dealing with praying like the heathens and praying like the the hypocrites. And the one way to, to deal with that, to counter hypocrisy and praying like a heathen, is to pray quietly, alone, pray alone before God. That is the antidote for hypocrisy and heathen-type prayers. Learning to pray alone. Cut yourself off from the world where the only person that can hear you is God Himself. So He would encourage us to isolate ourselves, which is what He did. He had a, on this case, He had a place. He was praying in a certain place. And He encourages us to do the same. To have a place without distraction. A place where we can withdraw from the world and not be intruded upon. Listen, listen. The occasions when God speaks to man and man speaks to God are the most holy moments in an unholy world. People are communing with God and God is communing with man. It's the most holy moments activity in this unholy world. This is why we take great care here. At least I trust we do, and I I see it exercised, that we protect our public worship and certain aspects of it, especially during prayer and preaching. It is common today in houses of worship to come and go as you please at any moment of the worship service, or what is called a worship service. You can literally come and go at any time, up and leave, come in, realize that you've forgotten your coffee, go and get it, come in and catch the, the last 20 minutes of the service. This is very normal today. And it ought not to be. We need to be attentive to what is going on when God is speaking to man and men are speaking to God. We need to cut off and minimize distractions. When I moved to Calgary, I addressed this matter as gently as I could on a number of occasions because I had never witnessed so much movement in public worship as I witnessed when I went there, and people were gathering in, and there were more joining, and and there was just all this movement. I I tried as gently as I could just to sort of, you know, shepherd them into the right way of thinking about when you're in the house of God. Sometimes subtle doesn't work, however. And that clearly was the case there. And some of them may be watching this, but it's, it's just one of those things that you, you learn from. And there was one particular occasion, and if you're talking here a congregation, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, at that time, 45 people, it's not large, maybe 50 at most. And uh, so I'm preaching. And three adults get up during my preaching to go to the restroom. I know that's where they're going because I I can hear it all going on. I know what's happening. So I just, (laughs) 
I finally was like, had it. And I was, let's just say, this is, I can't remember everything I said, but I was more direct on that occasion, trying to communicate what is actually going on. Oh, beloved, don't you get it? You get it? It's like the Lord is speaking through His Word. His Word. And you get up and turn your back on Him and go to the restroom while the Lord is speaking. He could have a word for you right in those moments and you're going to, really? I mean, if you have medical issues, I get it, understand, but, but I, I knew that wasn't the case for these people. It was, it was maybe lack of preparation, not, you know, thinking carefully. Um, going before the service, whatever needs to be done, just, just, and I, you know, I come from a place where, you know, you have like 250, 300 people in a church and they're all small children there and they're made to sit. You go to the restroom before the service. And if you have to go again, it goes after the service. And you don't move. You learn to be in God's presence. And appropriate to yourself a mentality of what is actually going on. This isn't the theater. This is meeting with God. Uh, it did sink in. There was an improvement after that. Little address on that point. I felt the same way here on Wednesday nights too, I must say to you. When, you know, I come and I bring my message and then I get down and I, I'm done praying and then I hear people leave. Like, I, it's like, I come for the message and after I've prayed or during my closing prayer before everyone else starts to pray, people begin to leave. And I think, 45 minutes, that's all. Just, just 45 minutes, another 45 minutes before the Lord with the Lord's people. Prayer possesses a certain gravity. As he was praying in a certain place, they waited until he ceased. They wouldn't interrupt. They wouldn't intrude. This is why we have people wait while there's prayer going on. If you're in late and prayer is being offered, you're made to stand in the hallway. If you're seen, you're encouraged to do that. There's reasons for this. We don't intrude. There's something going on. The distraction of the people of God as they call upon God, as they hear from God, is no light matter. And I know there are things that come in, but if we just all possessed more of a, an awareness to the gravity of meeting with God and hearing from God and calling upon God, it would be a healthy adjustment in all of our lives. This is not like other exercises. It is distinct. And if you can't see that, I, I wonder if you've ever really known prayer at all. It, I've made mention of this before. It's, it's, and I have caught myself doing it, so I, I stand condemned to where you're in a process of a service and you, you kind of move from one thing to the other and, and words begin to come out of your mouth before you're really in a frame of prayer. And I have felt that. I have been in mid-flow in prayer, feeling that you just stepped in. You, you just began to speak words, and you're not in the frame of being in the presence of God. There is a frame. There is a frame. It, it's, it's why the, the, the posture of the Scripture, there are various postures that, that reflect that when we pray, there's something that goes on. You don't Generally, you find men, they, they're bowing their heads, they're on their knees, they're prostrate before God. They're, you, you have these because there's, you have to shut out everything else. There is a gravity to prayer. Oh, we used to know this, it used to be commonplace. Now you have prayer that goes on. You know, men don't even remove their hats or anything. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing. Thirdly, this example shows that prayer arouses man's curiosity. This example shows that prayer arouses man's curiosity. At least for the disciples, their curiosity is aroused. 
When he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Which disciple came and asked? I don't know. Was he encouraged by the others to represent them? I don't know. Maybe he, being more spiritually attuned, realized we all need to learn this, whether they recognize it or not. I don't know. But again, they're not coming asking, how do you perform these miracles? They're not asking, how is it that you preach and never man speak like you? Or how do you deal with pastoral struggles and different things? No, they're, they're asking, teach us to pray. This is the one activity that every Christian can engage in, regardless of, of age, despite experience. There's a sense in which prayer is the most simple act and the most free and easily accessible spiritual act of any spiritual activity so that our children legitimately learn to pray and little ones learn to call upon God. And at the same time, we can still recognize that there's a height to this, an experience to this, a level regarding this that... that stirs our curiosity. Again, I don't know if you've ever been in the presence of someone who's praying, lifted you up, and almost opened you to new understandings of prayer. Oh, it's a glorious thing. You need that, you know. You need that. Oh, may the Lord give it to us here. So I've, I've, I've illustrated it this way before. It, it seemed impossible to run a mile in four minutes. It seemed impossible. And men tried and tried and tried. They could not break that four-minute mile. They kept trying. They couldn't do it. It was as if it can't be done. Then it was done. And there's a tide of people who can do it. It's like they opened the floodgates. The recognition, it's possible to do this. It can actually be done. And it opened up their minds and their training and their desire and their effort and their longing and they realized, I want to be found in that number. And when you pray with someone who has an elevated communion with God, it opens your heart and your experience to something you didn't know existed. And you crave after it. This is what happened to the disciples. Teach us to pray. What made them curious? Was it Christ's diligent frequency? Was it? We don't have a whole lot of detail about the, the frequency of Christ's prayer life, but it certainly appears to me that there's enough peppered through the Gospels to show us that regularly He would find seasons of prayer. He would get away, especially for extended seasons of prayer. Luke's Gospel more than any other gospel, marks this out. We've seen many of them already. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. So he's cutting himself off. That's the closet. It's withdrawal from people. It's getting away from distraction to pray. Literally it reads, but he himself was withdrawing in the desert places and praying. So he, he keeps on. It's a sense that this was his habit, to withdraw into desert places, to get away from the crowds of people, to slip away and seek God in prayer. Luke 6, verse 12, it's the occasion of choosing the apostles. In those days, he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Luke 9, 18, it came to pass as he was alone praying. His disciples were with him and asked him, saying, Whom say the people that I am? So he's often praying. And he has places where he prays. And it, and it would appear also, especially going by the detail in relation to the Gethsemane, it would appear that there were locations. When he would go into an area, he would know a place to go to. He would find a place. He would search out a place. And then... Once he found the right place, that's where he could be found. It's like when he would go back through these areas and these cities and these villages of Galilee or wherever he was, it seems to me that he had certain places where he would go. 
and I draw that conclusion from what is told us concerning Gethsemane, when in John 18, the little detail is given to us, Judas also, John 18 verse 2, which betrayed him, knew the place for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. That is to say, Judas knew exactly where to find Jesus Christ when he was in that vicinity and therefore knew at the particular time where to go. That's how he knew how to betray him, how to find him for the betrayal. So, so maybe it was the, the diligent frequency of the Lord, the way he would get away so regularly and spend these extended seasons in prayer. Maybe it was that that was capturing their attention. Or maybe, maybe it was Christ's physical ardency, not just his diligent frequency, but his physical ardency. And what I mean by that is the physicality of his praying. This may be imagination on my part, grant it too, but I find it difficult to imagine that Christ went from very, uh, let's say, uh, calm seasons of prayer where he never prayed with intensity, physical intensity, or long cries and longings to Gethsemane, like just, just normal, regular, calm offerings and petitions to Gethsemane. And he never had anything approaching close to that experience. That seems unrealistic to me. It would seem that there would need to be preparation for something like Gethsemane. And that some of the seasons of the praying of the Lord Jesus Christ would, would lean towards that kind of praying of strong crying and tears, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. I'm not saying that happened on any other occasion. What I'm saying is a certain kind of physical ardor was also a companion to his prayer life at various occasions. And maybe that is what the disciples had never seen before. What kind of praying is this? Now, I have to interject there and use language that was coming to my mind. So I'm not quoting verbatim, but I think it was McShane that says something to the effect that ardent believing is more important than ardent praying. What he means is that the aspect of the physical type of prayer, the ardent believing is more important than ardent praying. And that's true. All the physicality means nothing if there's not real faith. But maybe that was it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that. Or maybe it was Christ's scriptural fluency. I believe Christ prayed through Scripture. I do. I believe He interweaves Scripture in His praying. Israel is encouraged to do this in Hosea chapter 14, verse 2, when they're told in their call to repentance, take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto Him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. Take with you words. What words? The words of God's promises to forgive. Take the words that are given to you as His covenant people. Take those words before God in your repentance. I think you'll find this in Jonah's prayer in Jonah chapter 2. Jonah seems to interweave all sorts of, of psalm, passages from the Psalms in his praying. And Daniel does the same. In Daniel chapter 9, he is, he is weaving Scripture into his prayer. And so it would appear to me that the godly men did this. See, they would interweave Scripture into prayer, and I think Christ also would have done this. That he would have prayed scriptural prayers. He would have prayed prayers that were based on and bedded into the Word of God. And then when he's on the cross and he's... he's Speaking the language of Psalm 22, is that not indication of Scripture permeating his prayer life? I think so. I think so. So maybe it was that. Maybe it was this scriptural fluency that raised this curiosity. Teach us to pray. I, I've been there. I have. I've heard people weave Scripture into their prayers in a way that has made me envious. It's like, oh, Lord, what? Oh, help me, help me. It's marvelous. It's marvelous. It's, it's like medicine to the soul to hear someone weave Scripture into their praying. Learn to do it, Christian. Learn. Ask the Lord to help you with it. Or maybe, maybe it was Christ's miraculous efficacy. Perhaps he began to make the, to make the connection between his prayer life and the power in his ministry. Where, where he's praying and then these these great deeds are done. These miracles occur. These remarkable events transpire. Maybe that. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But their, their curiosity is, is piqued. And they, they want to know how to pray like the Lord prays. They see something in prayer 
that is more attractive, and they want to learn that more than all the other requests that people might be tempted to ask the Lord about. Teach us to pray. Lastly, this example shows that prayer reveals man's frailty. Prayer reveals man's frailty. Watching Christ, the disciples became aware of their frailty and weakness in this exercise. And the question I wondered when I was pondering this was, since John taught his disciples to pray, and that was public knowledge, and probably the practice of rabbi-type characters to teach their disciples in the exercise of prayer, since that was the case, that was the custom, we might say, why then has, has the Lord not done this? Why? Why would He delay such an education? Why would they have to come and ask Him? Why would the initiative not come from Him? I don't know if I have a solid answer for that, but I, I, I thought of this. Of all the things to try and teach someone that may be unwilling, perhaps the most impossible to teach is prayer. If people are not willing, you know what it's like in any area of life. If they don't want to do it, it's very difficult to teach them. But how much more difficult is it to teach someone prayer? if they don't see their need to learn. And so the Lord waits until they, until they initiate it, feeling the frailty in their own hearts, feeling the shortcoming in their own lives. It is then they are ready. And so it is for us. You will never learn to pray until you learn how little you know how to pray. You'll not be taught by the Spirit in the place of prayer until you recognize your need to be taught by the Spirit in the place of prayer. And you will drift on in some mediocre of existence of prayer for as long as you're content to continue on with a mediocre existence of prayer. And at the beginning of this year, would it not be Amidst our longing, our, our, our consideration this morning, shine forth, Lord, shine forth. Do so in this place, the place of prayer. Are you wanting to learn to pray, Christian? Wouldn't it be wonderful if at the end of this year you could say, where I advanced most this year was in prayer? That would be really nice, wouldn't it? That would be a year well spent. We would come to the end of 2022 and say, I may not have achieved everything I desired in various areas of my life, but I have grown right here. Oh, we need to learn it. We do. I have learned... I note this with sadness, that given the choice between the call to prayer and the call to nothing, most believers make haste to the latter. There's no burden to pray. The Scottish Presbyterian Thomas Chalmers rightly noted, and this is helpful, the praying disciple needs to be taught the necessity of labor, and the laboring disciple needs to be taught the necessity of prayer. When our men of devotion become men of diligence, and our men of diligence become men of devotion. When there is a union of humble hearts 
and busy hands. Then shall the wonders of the gospel be spread fruitfully abroad. What do you need to learn? Do you need to learn to be more busy? Or do you need to learn to pray? Take the words of this disciple. Make them a prayer. Lord, teach us. Ah, it'd be good if we all were taught this year, wouldn't it? Again, it's like Asaph. He's not just concerned with himself. He's concerned with the plurality. Teach us to pray. May the Lord help us. Let's bow together in prayer. We take these moments in the presence of God. I've made no appeal at this point to those unconverted, but I do so now. Are you without Christ? Is your non existent prayer life testify to the absence of regeneration? in your testimony? Do you know what it is to be saved? And God marks, behold, he prayeth. God sees, he looks down and beholds. He sees whether you pray or whether you do not. Are you marked by this evidence of new life? You have the spirit of prayer and supplication given to all believers in Christ. Do you enjoy communion with God? Or is it the farthest thing from your desire to spend time in prayer? This, these are discerning features, marks, where amidst your confusion of being brought up in a Christian home, you can distinguish whether or not you really are the Lord's. If you need any help, I'm here as your servant for Christ's sake. Lord, we pray. Enable us And teach us to pray. We confess our sin in this regard. Our negligence of this privilege. We have an advocate. We have a mediator. We have one who will come and commune with us as friend with friend. Yet we neglect thee. Forgive our sins, we pray. And bless us in this singular fashion this year where heaven may testify to this fact. This year, I taught them to pray. Be with us as we part from this place. Go with those that go down the stairs and sanctify the fellowship there tonight. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy people now and evermore.